Tom. Great. Take it away, Coach. Great. Oh, okay. So, uh, oh. which? Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you. Oh, uh, Kurt. Sorry, I, I've been keeping the Zoom window off the main screen, but I'm gonna put this on there. Great. Awesome. Okay. Can someone tell me confirm which screen of mine is being shared? Uh, it, it has the slides on it. The slides? Okay, great. So, I mean, it's not slides in presentation mode. Yeah. yeah, great. Excellent. Okay, excellent. So, um, uh, happy, to, happy to know that uh, the, the, the conferences or the uh, boot camps that I was a part of are the early boot camps, that this has continued on for many years. Uh, it's a really wonderful service, and I'm always... Uh, I'm always wishing that I could attend, and I'm I'm frequently uh, pleased when I get invited to present a little bit. Um, so, for the last couple of years, I've been doing uh, engaged pretty closely with uh, modeling COVID in the province, um, and uh, obviously it's part of a larger team. I'm just the person who holds the the modeling hand. Uh, but what I'd like to present on, because I I think based on all of my previous experience up until COVID, this last couple of years has been I'm sure everyone can agree, very unique, but it's been unique in a couple specific ways. Uh, most notably because um, it's an embedded ABM. So it's, uh, it's really from on the, it's a policy model instead of a research model. Um, and so the primary purpose of this model has not been to generate results and then put in a paper or publish them, but it has been really to turn around quick, consistent, um, uh, insight and feedback from the model regarding what types of both public health policy as well as operational policy uh, to consider at the, at the province level. So I think uh, it's been a really kind of a different environment and there's a lot to learn. And obviously, uh, I'll talk about a few different pieces. And uh, wherever people's interests lie, I'll try to keep the presentation component reasonably short to get a good review of what we're doing so that there's as much time as possible for questions for people if we want to focus our attention on any of these areas. So I'm going to start on, I'm going to talk about five areas. They're not all the same size. Uh, and the first one is, okay, so these five areas are, are what we are kind of, we've assembled as kind of the key components for uh, applied health system modeling. So again, it's, it's a policy model. So obviously the first component, uh, not necessarily the first in time, but the first component we'll talk about today is a map of the process that we're trying to model or that we're trying to understand. So in this context, at this stage of the game, it's obviously going to be a COVID model. And so I'll get into that in the section one. And then we'll talk about once we have, once we've gone through what this model looks like, we'll talk about um, the data that we're using to parameterize this model, to estimate, to compare against. Um, and obviously in the health system space, this is going to be uh, very noisy, very difficult, obviously, to, to, get, to get all of the data that we'd like, possible to get all the data we'd like. Um, so we'll talk about some of the things, some of the interesting parts around the data. And we'll talk about some of the other evidence that we're driving, uh, that we're using to inform the model. And importantly, because this is a model in, an, in a sort of a really dynamic, active environment of engaging with non-modelers, uh, it's important to talk about the contextual knowledge and how we interact with operational leaders and key stakeholders. Uh, and then the last part is, you know, there's a team that are part of the model. There's a team that we're engaged with in informing the model on a less regular basis, but they're still quite in touch with what the modeling is attempting to do. And then there's a team that's a little bit more uh, separated from the model. And so there's a lot of knowledge translation that needs to be considered when we're looking at that uh, presentation to other stakeholders. So the first thing we'll get into is the map, the model itself. Um, this one's built in any logic. Uh, Wade was key to the initial construction of it, and a lot of the a lot of the coding work and design ideas that he put in are still in the model to this day. So uh, he is to be commended for his great work on that. And for the last couple of years, two and a half years, I guess, getting on, um, I've been the lead developer taking this model. So it's a GIS representation of Saskatchewan, and on the right is just a snapshot of how that uh, is represented in the model. Um, so we have, a, we have a, a number of different types of agents. We have people, hospitals, uh, long-term care facilities, schools, households, workplaces. And so there's a lot of time and effort. A lot of this was uh, from way. There's a lot of effort going into thinking about all the different structured environments in which people mix uh, so that we can capture uh, how, how you know, a pathogen would be spreading in a population. 
There's other agents that are not represented in a physical fashion. So we have gatherings, this was added later on, uh, tests, contact tracing, variants, and vaccines. These are all uh, agents or agent-like entities in the model um, that are used for different purposes. Uh, and just as a small note, as maybe we've seen that anything in any logic, it's a continuous time model. Uh, I'm really just going to talk about a couple of the agents. The other agents, the so long-term care schools, households, and workplaces, um, those agents are really conceptualized as agents just so that we could have a map location for them. So they're not dynamic. They don't have a lot of behavior. Um, they're really just a place where we can send a person. They can send a person to a school or to a household or to a workplace based on geographic factors and demographic factors. We send people to certain schools. Uh, but beyond that, the school is just a blank environment in which people mix. Um, and so we'll talk about people in hospitals are the most uh, important agents of the, the GIS model. And then we'll talk about some of the agents as well. So the person agent is very complex. This is the big agent that we have. And there's a number of different types of behaviors that we want to capture, most of which are captured with um, st uh, state charts. So uh, as with most COVID models, this is a form of an SEIR model. So here we have susceptible, exposed, infective, and recovered. Uh, and we've had to modify it a little bit given the changing understanding and the changing la landscape with regards to COVID protection, COVID immunity. So normally an SEIR model, you are uh, in that R state until you lose protection, and then you go back to susceptible. But as we'll talk about uh, uh, later on, we have to extend our, our, our understanding of what recovered looks like. Uh, and so we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But basically, we've got these, these, uh, you know, these, these, these four states. Those are basically represented there. Now, um, initially, we had uh, you know, the, the infection state chart was overlapping with the symptom state chart, but that's been broken out. The symptoms is captured, captured separately, um, and this is partly to consider that people can be no longer infectious but still symptomatic, and so that's why they're captured as two separate state charts. Um, but basically, the symptom state chart is quite complex, um, and really we're, what we're looking at is a, a kind of like an aging chain, but when it comes to symptoms. So we have baseline COVID, which just means um, it's a baseline symptom, so it's, there's no COVID symptoms. Uh, and, then, and then somebody can, if they become infected, they can enter this pre-symptomatic stage, which means they're still asymptomatic. The so baseline and pre-symptomatic are both asymptomatic, um, but they're distinguished by, by one being infected and one not being infected. So they're pre-symptomatic. And then after a period of time, um, depending on the person, depending on uh, some characteristics of the person, after a period of time, uh, they can switch off and they can either remain what we're calling posse-symptomatic, which is, uh, it's, you know, it, could, it could be anywhere from asymptomatic to just mildly symptomatic. It's basically not symptomatic enough to want to seek out um, testing or care from a hospital. Maybe they're a little tired, maybe there's a little bit of a runny nose, but otherwise they're functioning normally. Uh, so that's posse-symptomatic. Uh, and then we have three other different states. We've got mildly symptomatic, and this is mild from a clinical perspective. So this would be sick enough that you might want to go to the doctor to get tested or presented in emergency department to get tested, but not so sick that they would admit you to the hospital. And then we have severe COVID. And so this would be sick enough that you'd be admitted to the acute ward of the hospital, but not so sick that you would be admitted to the ICU. And uh, from the severe COVID state, you, you also can't die. Uh, that's not a lethal state. And then we have critical COVID, which is uh, you, you, you need ICU care. You can die in that state. Uh, and if you, don't, if you don't get care right away, then, then you'll have those negative repercussions. Um, and then all of these initial and purse states are really just to allow some people to basically stop progressing their symptoms. So some people, will once they get infected, they will just remain posse symptomatic. Others will get off the bus at uh, mild symptoms. Others will get off the bus at severe symptoms. And then others will progress to critical. And then they go back to post-critical, which is, again, a form of severe, before they end up going back to baseline. So this is sort of just capturing all the different ways that once somebody gets sick, they can increase the severity of their uh, symptoms, but they can also decrease them to some extent. Now, uh, this one has slightly changed from the current version of the model, but this captures uh, what's happening. 
So we're, we have what's called an augmented protection state chart. So this is a, a relatively new addition. It's only in the last, well, year or so. Um, but certainly in the, in the realm of a normal kind of like simplified SEIR model, we only consider, uh, you know, when somebody is recovered, they're only recovered, meaning they're protected. It's a Boolean value. Are they recovered? Yes or no. Um, and when it comes to uh, when it comes to COVID, we, we know that we have to extend that understanding a little bit. So basically, the way this works is um, somebody can be immunologically naive. Um, so that means they've never had a COVID infection before, based on either a COVID infection or a vaccination, because we know both of those events create protection. Then basically, what happens is that person will then jump into this chain and they will essentially sample a new state. They will decide they're, they're gonna occupy one of five different protection states. So they can be protected from everything, protected from infection, or they can be susceptible to infection, but protected from clinical disease, so protected from mild symptoms and therefore everything worse. Or they can be susceptible to infection and clinical disease, but protected from hospitalization or just death, or be unprotected. So they won't be naive immunologically, but still that vaccine or that exposure didn't protect them, they're still unprotected. And then you can see that there's a waning step between each of these. So this functionally assumes then that when somebody gets infected and that, or vaccinated, multiply vaccinated, multiply infected, all the different variants, uh, whatever combination, they get to this protected from infection state. And after a period of time, they will, they will lose that and they will go down to clinic, uh, protection just from clinical disease, which means that you can't lose protection from, let's say, admission to hospital or death until you've lost protection from these other things first. So this is one of the assumptions that we're making uh, regarding um, immunity. And you can lose protection from infection, but still spread it to others and still be protected from going to the hospital. Uh, and so then we just have to specify how this wanes. And I should mention that it's a little more complex because we actually have a state chart like this for every variant in the model. So we'll, we'll talk about variants in a little bit, but we have multiple variants, uh, N variants. We can make new variants if we like. And basically, there's a copy of this protection state chart for every variant. So now, based on every exposure and vaccine that I receive, I, as an individual in the model, as an agent in the model, will calculate what is my protection status from every given variant. And so we have to find a way of basically, if I'm getting infected, let's say from a BA1 variant, uh, then that's going to give me more protection from BA1 than it's going to give me from BA2 or BA5, for example. So there's, there's some uh, mechanism hiding behind there. Uh, on the behavior side, we are somewhat, we are somewhat simplistic. Um, and so really, we just have, this, you know, there's a few characteristics. People can be in self-isolation. Certainly that happens, especially early on in the pandemic, if somebody tests positive. And then they're asked to self-isolate. So some fraction of the population will comply with that. They'll self-isolate. There were community cohorts as an intervention early in the modeling history. We haven't uh, used that. And then we have people just mixing in society. But we also have mask compliance. And everybody will be equally compliant with wearing masks in all contexts. Uh, we also have what's called a risk tolerance. So we recognize that not everybody will not just wear masks, but will reduce their mixing. Um, based on the, their perceived COVID risk. And so different populations will have different risk tolerances, so they'll be mixing different ways. Uh, and then we have a gathering daily rate, which is basically outside of the environments where we described mixing, so schools, households, workplaces, and so on. Outside of that, people can gather in sort of more social or less structured environments. And so the gathering daily rate corresponds with how often they're engaging in those gatherings. Now, uh, people um, can attend many, they can be in many different associated locations. I say associated location because the agent is not physically moving around on the map. Um, it's, it's determined a little bit more statistically, but they're associated with different locations. So they have a, a home region. Again, this, this model is very um, geographically diverse. So we have Saskatoon and Regina and Moose Jaw and, um, all sorts of communities in the province that are spread out geographically. And so their home and their work are associated with some region and they don't necessarily need to be the same. So people can work and, and live in uh, you know, neighboring regions or close by regions, even if it's not the same. 
Uh, they have a household in which they, where, where they can mix with other members of the household. They have up to two workplaces, so different uh, people can have two work, up to two workplaces. They can have a school, which could include a high school. Um, they have a care facility that they're, a uh, long-term care facility. They can be at a hospital either as a staff or as a patient, uh, and then they can be in a gathering. And so then they have sort of this contact schedule that determines in any given hour of the day, where are they so that they can determine who else is there and when they're sending an infection message, they can tell who they're gonna be infecting. Obviously, uh, persons are also uh, distinguished by dem demographics. So we have age and sex primarily are the demographics um, that we're capturing at the moment. There, are, there is some variation for people who live um, in different geographic environments. So we know populations in the North, for example, experience more uh, negative outcomes for the same age and sex demographics. And so we do have some way of uh, capturing that. Uh, we also have long COVID in the model. This is a bit old, um, but we do have long COVID in the model, which was some of our, some of our earlier work and a little bit more recently. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty around that, and that may come back later, but we do have sort of some way of capturing long COVID. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, though. If, we, if there's interest, we can come back to it. Uh, and then all of the things that we've described, we all also have characterized for flu. So at different stages of this process, there's interest in understanding how flu uh, uh, how, how COVID and flu might interact. So we do have that in there. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. The mechanisms are basically the same. We just characterize it as a flu infection message instead of a COVID infection message. So then the second agent that uh, has some substantial st structure is the hospital agent. Uh, this is a, it's a relatively simple hospital. It's basically a, queue, a queuing hospital. So we've got these kind of three areas of the hospital, the ED, the acute or the non-ICU wards, and then the ICU wards. Uh, and basically it's structured so that uh, people can either enter the hospital through self-presentation. In this case, they're only presenting for COVID reasons. So we don't have anyone presenting to the ED or the hospital in general for non-COVID reasons. We don't have kind of a background admission for non-COVID reasons. So they'll present for care. And basically um, if, there's a need for them to get tested, then they can get tested. The hospital checks to see if they should be admitted. If they're in the um, severe or critical symptom state, then they'll be admitted. Otherwise, they'll be tested and sent home. Uh, and, then, and then they basically have, uh, they can basically occupy their time in this inpatient ward. If somebody goes from uh, severe to critical COVID symptoms, they can be upgraded or downgraded, I guess, from non-ICU care to ICU care. And then once their symptoms return back to non-life-threatening, then they go back down to the non-ICU care before they're exited. We do have structure that allows us to transfer between hospitals. So on that map earlier, there's hospitals across the province. Uh, for the last little while, we haven't been using that. So that's, uh, really, that's really sort of something that we did in the past and we've moved on from without removing it. There is contact tracing as well. So these are not geographically represented, uh, but there's a contact tracing process because we know contact tracing is really important, but we wanted to capture also the delay in contact tracing because that's really important given that uh, from exposure, uh, from, from the time that you're infectious to other people to the time that you've recovered might, depending on the person, only be several days, five days, seven days, 10 days. If your contact tracing is taking two or three of those days, that can play a big role in whether or not contact tracing is efficient or is effective. Um, so we do have a structure in place where people can essentially get, you know, when somebody's infected, they can be, if they develop symptoms and they go to the hospital and it's found that they're, that they're symptomatic, that individual can then be called on to report their different uh, connections or interactions that they've had with other people. Um, and, then, and then those individuals who are, as who are asymptomatic are brought in and they're tested and then uh, we can specify the model to continue that contact tracing or not. So we can essentially specify what fraction of the population on what demographics, how many people per day will be contact traced um, based on whether they report their, their friends or their colleagues or not. Um, so this does allow us to kind of capture people. And then based on the positive test, if there's a positive test, then we can ask somebody to self-isolate or not self-isolate, go to isolation or whatever, depending on, um, depending on the result of their test. And then there's a little bit as well for testing. So testing itself has some lab delay. It's a, it's a simple, basically it's just a queue 
uh, where we basically have a time lag uh, specified. So when a test comes in, they don't immediately return the result. It waits a period of time before that happens. <clears throat> uh, the gatherings we have, the, the reason why we created gatherings um, is basically because we recognize that human populations are not mixing just in the structures that we created in those agents. So they're mixing outside of homes, workplaces, and schools. Um, and basically there were three, three categories of environments that we wanted to capture. So we created this gatherings structure. Uh, this was heavily informed by Dr. Osgood, but we created this gathering structure that allows us to, uh, to basically, um, it's, it's sort of a random mixing way. We create a gathering with N agents and we specify how often or how much they're mixing and how, how dense they are as a population, how many people are there, how long it is. And we essentially in a moment just calculate uh, probabilistically who in that population gets infected given that there was one, two, or three uh, people in the population who were infectious. And so the reason why we wanted to do this was to capture mixing outside, like I said, of that kind of structured mixing. Uh, and it was primarily kind of three areas. So we parameterized private social gatherings. So this is having somebody over at your house. Um, we characterized public social gatherings, which could be something like going to a restaurant or a bar or a movie theater. And so in a public social gathering, there's gonna be more people and they're gonna be mixing a little differently and then there'll be a different length of time. And then we also parameterized it for a public non-social gathering. So this would be going to a store, going to a mall, going someplace public, going to a grocery store, going someplace public where it's not for social reasons. We characterize these three types of gatherings, and then we can control this mixing. This is one of the, 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 the levers that we pull when we're calibrating the model and running what-if scenarios, is because we, we don't really have good data on how often people are going to house parties or gatherings or whatever. Um, so it's a lot of sort of just expert opinion and, and, and uh, consultation with stakeholders and what they feel is comfortable values. And then these are some numbers that we're varying up and down to kind of modify people's behavior over time through the model. Uh, there's a couple other little models that I built. I, we don't need to just spend time talking about those, but uh, sometimes it's helpful to build a couple little models to support some of the components of your model. So here's a vaccine waning model. It's just a stock flow model that we use to help us estimate what the parameters for waning would be in, in that uh, step down process that I showed up earlier. Um, and so this is a very simple model that we can use to calibrate separately. And we also have a length of stay estimator. So our data will often tell us census data and admission data, but the model has to specify what's the length of stay that we're going to assume for a certain demographic. So we can have a little model that's kind of used as a statistical tool to estimate what is going to be an appropriate length of stay to get a specific census number from a specific, uh, like a census time series from a specific admission time series. So this can be, um, is, you know, helpful little submodels to, to support. So that's the end of the model and I'll, I'll try to just wing through the data part. I'm already going a little longer than I'd like, but um, give some time for questions. So what's the data that we use to parameterize the model? The most important data, obviously, is going to be daily admissions to the ICU and daily admissions to the non-ICU. Um, so this is, this is publicly available data from Saskatchewan where we have non-ICU admissions per day, uh, non-ICU census, the ICU admissions per day, the ICU census, and it's broken down by geographic area. So we have Saskatoon, Regina, the rural communities, integrated rural and integrated northern communities uh, over time. And then it's also broken down by age. Uh, different age groups. So we have that level of um, sort of uh, detail and data uh, where we can look at where, where the number of admissions are going. Um, obviously, we have case data as well, but basically since, you know, it's, that's always been a little bit more um, uh, noisy of a signal, especially since the emergence of Omicron. Um, so we, we end up relying much more heavily on uh, admissions data. Uh, and so that's sort of the workhorse, but obviously we look at we also use admissions data, or sorry, uh, uh, vaccine data. Uh, so we have admissions by vaccine status we can, we can use, uh, and we have um, what, what fraction of the population test positive on admission for the first time versus having tested positive before admission to the hospital. So some of these sorts of data are things that we use um, not, to, not to parameterize the model, but to 
to challenge our assumptions about the, what the model is suggesting. So for example, we're seeing that there's a large fraction of the population who are testing first on admission to the hospital. We can recognize that during that phase, maybe there wasn't a lot of community testing taking place. And that can help us then maybe modify some parameters or just interpret the model in a better way. Um, so this doesn't necessarily change. That we're not calibrating to this, but we're interpreting the results of the model in the light of these other more complex data sources. Um, and obviously we have vaccine data. So uh, the model needs to specify that the population, again, this is the one-to-one -one agent based model. So there's 1.2 million agents, there's 1.2 million people in Saskatchewan. And so we wanna make sure that the distribution, the geographic and age distribution of vaccines by brand and by dose number uh, and by time are similar. So we take data from the, from the, from the from Saskatchewan's vaccine program, and we do the same thing and apply that into the model. Um, other types of analyses that are part of our communication is relative risk with vaccines. Uh, it's good to keep these things in mind to make sure that the model is uh, giving us something reasonable from what we would expect. There's all sorts of other data that we that we look at: um, and contacts per case, for case for uh, contact tracing. Uh, we compare between Saskatchewan and other jurisdictions. We look at length of stay, vaccine effectiveness, wastewater. So this model isn't directly reading in wastewater, but obviously we're examining wastewater. And as a modeler, I'm trying to balance the insights coming from that into how we should be parameterize the model or, or change the model or so on. Um, and the calibration phase, basically, um, there's essentially two, two really important parameters up until Omicron, the two biggest ones. One had to do with how often people were gathering, how infectious they were, essentially what was the R naught. Um, and it's not exactly the same thing because this is an agent-based model. So what we want to talk about is the individual personal daily chance of spreading COVID to someone in your environment. So that mixing behavior is characterized um, during a period of time when there were no policies, there, was, um, there were no masking policies or there was no vaccine. And so this is kind of our baseline mixing behavior. And it's during the months of September to November 2020. And there's a period of exponential growth in the wild type variant. Um, and so then, and then basically after November 2020 in the model, we fix the contact rate for each age group. And then, uh, and then we vary the, the, the social gathering mixing over time. So we specify that to a, a number. We characterize the individual infectiousness, the contact rate. Uh, and then once those are fixed, then we can vary the behavior over time because that's really where we expect most of the changes in relative infectiousness is going to happen is whether people are A, wearing masks, whether they're um, inviting people to their house and gathering or whether they're isolating. Um, and so that's the behavior that we're varying over time. That's kind of how we're calibrating the model. Uh, and yeah, we do this regularly, weekly or twice or, or fortnightly. And there's a lot of different interventions that we've explored. Um, you know, we, we project forward to just in the short term, obviously there's not a lot of things that we can do from a public health perspective, uh, but short-term modeling is really helpful for understanding, uh, for, for assisting the operations, um, the operation stakeholders to understand where they should, you know, are we gonna be, should we move nurses around? Should we change how load leveling is done between hospitals? Um, so the short-term projections are not, Kind of what if scenarios we're really just trying to understand where we're going to be in one two or three weeks time and then we look at medium term scenarios where we're looking at maybe more public policy this is changing a little bit now with covid uh, with omicron as that there's maybe a little bit less room for this but um, masking or mixing policies school closure policies vaccine passports these are all types of policies that we've been exploring that we've explored over the last couple of years and those are typically on the medium term cycle so two three four months uh, and then sometimes we have time to do longer term, uh, to do longer term forecasting or, or what if scenarios, uh, specifically looking at other new variants or other respiratory infections like flu or RSV. Uh, so, so we don't do that a whole lot because we're often usually stuck in between these first two, but sometimes we do have that uh, flexibility. And uh, uh, maybe talk a little bit, I, I'll just breeze over these a little bit quickly in case if there's questions, we can come back to it. But um, obviously, with this model, again, there's a lot in re regular, regular, like multiple times per week, depending on the phase of the pandemic. Uh, we're meeting with operational leaders, with clinical experts. Uh, with We regularly, multiple times, like three or four times a, a week, we're often meeting with data experts, people who are understanding 
where the data is coming from, what, how the data is gathered, what are the assumptions made on the data. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of interaction with people outside of the sort of core model team to understand the quality of the model, to improve the quality of the model based on domain expertise, uh, really fundamentally to build confidence in the model. I think we've done a bang up job in working with uh, many of the stakeholders to really develop, uh, to show them the value of this kind of modeling environment uh, and to build confidence in the model. So much so that often we will meet and we'll show results of the model. Sometimes the results will be challenging and they will question you know, in a, in a sincere way, they'll question the results of the model and they'll often provide feedback to the model to fix the model or because you know, as the modeling team, we work with the model to try to understand why it's doing something. We give them back an answer that then uh, teaches them something about the, uh, about the landscape. And so it ends up building confidence in the model because it helped them learn about something. So there's this really back and forth, significant back and forth learning uh, process. And obviously it determines the direction of model development because you know, the operational leaders and, and uh, stakeholders will give, a, give us uh, questions that they want to ask of the model. And again, that, that sort of really requires the back and forth, those types of questions, because what I found is if somebody's asking questions but they haven't to sort of developed a relationship with the modeling team, that question may not be the questions that they, they want to ask. So there's obviously a need for that back and forth relationship to, for the, us as a modeling team to understand what they're trying to ask to make sure that it's, it can be asked appropriately with this model or maybe there might be other methods to do so. Uh, and so a lot of different experts in the field that we've worked with. So operations and medical health officers, epidemiologists, there was a technical working group, uh, different PHAC modeling experts, frontline teams, leadership teams, the Ministry of Health individuals. So lots of people that we've had to work with, uh, they've gotten to work with. Uh, and then the knowledge translation, obviously, again, this is very bi-directional. It's primarily about helping stakeholders understand what modeling can and can't do. Um, and then really trying to understand what questions we're trying to answer. Um, and, and ultimately, because it's a policy model, we're regularly trying to figure out how do we translate model outputs into actionable intelligence. Uh, and that translation is at least half of the work of building a model. Uh, whenever we're, doing a, we're working on knowledge translation, there's a lot of expertise in the modeling team. And obviously, this clearly goes outside of the realm of just the modeler. Uh, but on our team, we have experts that are not modeling, but they're clinical experts. And so there's a lot of back and forth to figure out how do we take these results and show them to the stakeholders to communicate a message, to show a story that doesn't distract. Um, and so there's a lot of work being put into that. And again, I would say it's at least as difficult, as much as time consuming to do that as the modeling is. Uh, and then we'll come up with different visuals to show you know, different scenarios and how many cases per day we might experience. And sometimes we'll show it in a time series where we can kind of break down different scenarios and explore kind of the conditions for one or the conditions for the other. Um, and so this is a really important part. And I obviously haven't given it, you know, nearly as much time as the modeling part, but it deserves that much time. And in the end, this is the last slide. In the end, I would say um, the key message is that we need to integrate all of these uh, modeling needs to be integrated into the decision-making process. We have evolving data, an iterative process, there's a lot of short and long-term planning. This is an uncomfortable one, learning how to embrace uncertainty uh, in the health space. I think that's just a fundamental part. Um, and that's sometimes, I think, my own reflection, sometimes where some of the re resistance comes for using something like a model um, is that it really, really highlights for us where our uncertainty and the degree of our uncertainty um, so that can sometimes be a point of, uh, of resistance, but I think it's really fundamental. Uh, and all of it is kind of held together with the idea of building trust through collaborative relationships, because this modeling is really, maybe more than any other approach that I've st studied, is really a collaborative process. Um, so that's a lot. I'm happy to take any questions that, uh, that anyone might have. you, Kurt. Um, much appreciated. We uh, do have some questions coming in on the chat, um, and I'd be glad to relay 
you know, any in the room. Um, or do you want to read the chat or, or should I read it to you? Is that, is that best? You want me to just uh, read the chat question and then try to address it? Yeah, yeah or I could, why don't I read it out because people in the room aren't on the chat. Sure. The um, so Sungju asks, uh, thanks for the clear presentation. I know it wasn't the core focus area, but I'm still curious to know what kinds of COVID flu interactions were assumed in the model and if you saw any emergent interactions. Thank you for that question. I'm also curious on whether there's an emergent interaction. Uh, so we put the flu 